Hey, that was such a great song. I, I, all the songs have been so powerful. And, um, you know, Easter's an amazing time of the year because it doesn't get co-opted like other holidays for uh, secular purposes as much. In fact, there's a general belief and an acknowledgement that there's a holy aspect to Good Friday particularly, but the Easter weekend, and people don't want to... Uh, be disrespectful to that. It, it amazes me that it took until this year for the AFL, the largest sport in this country, to play football on Good Friday. I mean, it just makes sense that in a secular um, liberal democracy, they wouldn't play that they would play football on Good Friday. But there's been a sacredness associated with Easter, which I think is really interesting. That people see that there's something unique about the cross. Of Jesus that we don't want to really we don't really understand what it's all about but we want to leave it untouched. Easter for me this morning involved an Easter egg hunt um, in my backyard and we you know the kids were negotiating trying to collect little Easter eggs while not picking up little rabbit poos um, that were in our backyard because we got a rabbit because they were meant to be the cleanest animal that you could get um, and and my wife assured me that rabbits they do all their business in one place in the corner and they and, and but let me tell you that one place is the whole backyard and. Um, <laughs> And so we had a, an exciting time, and, and he said, let's have a photo with the three kids. Do you, did any of you know my three kids? With the three kids and the rabbit in the one picture. So um, I think we might have got one blurry one, so I look forward to seeing that. Uh, I had a conversation with my four-year-old son, who's actually sitting in the front row. He's listening to something on Nikki's phone, so he doesn't know what I'm saying. But he, he said, told me the other day that Jesus died on the cross... And then he came back. Um, he came out of the grave and he became an angel. And I said, oh, that's beautiful, Jojo. I was so proud that he's talking about Easter. I used all of my self-control not to correct him and tell him that Jesus didn't actually come back as an angel. Because I actually think it's funny that my four-year-old son, as he's trying to grasp the idea of Easter, it's very easy to have a sentimental idea of Easter. It's this really nice idea of good overcoming evil, of life overcoming death. And for many of us and many people in this world, they think, oh, yeah, maybe Jesus spiritually rose from the dead and appeared to people as an angel or as a vision. And that's just symbolic that at the end of the day, love does overcome evil, that good does win. But let me tell you that the Easter story is as radical today as it was 2,000 years ago. 2,000 years ago, there wasn't people walking around saying, we believe that people can die and physically be resurrected and never die again. That was as unheard of 2,000 years ago as it is today. And we are all here, many of us, and Christians right around the world have staked our claim on the fact, not just that Jesus appeared in dreams and visions, but Jesus bodily appeared in flesh, risen from the dead, and he is alive today. And it is radical and crazy sounding, but it is as important today that we grasp the radical, life-changing truth of the Easter story for ourselves. Because I want to suggest that every person here needs to come to terms with the story of Easter. Every person in this room has to say, what does the story of Easter mean to me? Either I reject it or I embrace it. I don't just accept part of it. I accept that Jesus really did rise from the dead and is the only person that's ever done that and not died again. And that he really is who he said he is. He is the Lord of the world or he is a liar. And I think that when I see some of the people that got baptized, when I see um, particularly people that have had a, a lot to do with, can I just say, Jesse Beagley, when I look at, um, when I look at Daniel, who was getting baptized, I can see, even in these last months, I can see a change in their faces as the love of God is doing a work in their life. Have you ever met someone and you see that they are changed? Have you ever seen a young man and it's like he's changed? And let me tell you, it's very rarely because he got a job. It's very normally because he fell in love. Do you know what I mean? There's certain things that only love can do to a person. And love changes us. But the problem with love is that that person that has a smile on their dial one week, the next week is a frown. Does everyone know what I mean? 
And, but the thing is, the love of God, and if the Easter story is true, it is the story of love that radically shifts our life and should permanently change the countenance, if not on our face, on our soul. That is the Easter story. And I want to just talk about three things really quickly that keep us from God and three things that Easter overcomes. The first thing that I want to talk about is disappointment. Disappointment, I think, is a big thing that keeps us from God. Disappointment in how a relationship didn't turn out. Disappointment in how a job didn't work out. Disappointment in yourself. Disappointment in others. The thing that amazes me in the Bible is that some of the people that get disappointed the most are not the bad people. They're actually really, really good people that didn't deserve bad things to happen. Do you ever look around the world and just get disappointed at the state of our world? Do you get disappointed at sometimes bad things happen to really good people? Mary Magdalene in the Bible has a reputation for being a very immoral woman, but she actually wasn't an immoral woman. She was a good woman. And we we don't know a lot about her, but we know that she was afflicted with demons and, and sickness, and she was in a bad way in her life. She was trying to make the best of her life. And she placed her trust in Jesus. And Jesus delivered her from the things that were oppressing her life. And she became like a brand new person. And she was the most dedicated follower of Jesus. You know, the most dedicated disciples of Jesus were not men, they were women. They followed Jesus with everything they had. And Mary Magdalene was at the front and center. She loved Jesus with all of her heart. And then it happened. Jesus died on a cross. Let's read from uh, John's gospel in John chapter 20. Early in the first day of the week, while it was still dark, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb and saw that the stone had been removed at the entrance. So she came running to Simon Peter the other, and the other disciple, the one Jesus loved, and said, They have taken the Lord out of the tomb, and we don't know where they've put him. First thing I want to mention is that Mary Magdalene is the one going to visit the tomb. Where are the blokes? They're sleeping in. They've had a lot on. Mary is dedicated. It says in one of the other Gospels that uh, the women went and they, they brought spices and they wanted to attend to Jesus. And there's this picture of dedication in Mary. Dedication. You see, there's an old uh, poem, I think written a couple hundred years ago. It says this about Mary. Not she with traitorous kiss her master stung. Not she denied him with unfaithful tongue. She, when apostles fled, could dangers brave. Last at the cross and earliest at the grave. Isn't that beautiful? Mary was last at the cross and she was earliest at the grave. But there was a desperation in her that her heart was broken and she didn't know what to do. And sometimes I think when people's hearts are broken, they just keep on turning up because they don't know what to do. So Peter and the other disciples started for the tomb. Both were running, but the other disciple outran Jesus and reached the tomb first. He bent over and looked at the strips of linen lying there, but he did not go in. When Simon Peter along came behind him, went straight into the tomb. He saw the strips lying there, as well as the cloth that had been wrapped around Jesus' head. The cloth was still lying in place, separate from the linen. Finally, the other disciple, who had reached the tomb first, also went inside. He saw and believed. They did not understand from Scripture that Jesus had, had, sorry, that Jesus had to rise from the dead. Then the disciples went back to where they were staying. Now Mary stood out the tomb, crying. As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb. They're late, they're sleeping in, they're in, they're out. They're thinking, man, what's happened? There's, some of them had faith, some of them didn't know what to believe, it says in the other gospel. Some of them were perplexed. But Mary stood outside the tomb and she was just crying that she didn't know what had happened to Jesus. You know, disappointment was true for Mary in that moment. She was so disappointed that the one, the great love of her life had been crucified. In uh, a week ago is Palm Sunday and Jesus entered into Jerusalem and people were singing out, Hosanna to the son of David, Hosanna in the highest. 
And it, was, it would have reminded people of around a, a 150 years earlier of the triumphant entrance after the victory of, of uh, the Maccabees brothers over their occupiers, the Syrian occupiers in Jerusalem. And these uh, uh, Simon Maccabees entered into Jerusalem as a political and as a, a, a military victor who had thrown out their oppressors and taken back Jerusalem for the people of God. And so as the people in Jerusalem at that time were crying out to Jesus, they were crying out, Hosanna, will you save us politically? Will you save us militarily? Will you be the one that will defeat the Romans and cast them out of Jerusalem? And so they were saying, we praise you because we think we know what we're going to get. How many of us in this room have said, God, we will praise you. We will give you a Sunday. We will give you a prayer every now and again, but we want to know what we're going to get. And then God doesn't answer our prayer in the way we expect. Or God doesn't look like what we expect. You see, those same people that said, Hosanna, save us, a week later were yelling out, crucify him because of their disappointment. Let me tell you, for everyone in this room, God wants to replace your disappointment with something. But I don't know if you know what he's going to replace it with. He's going to replace it with disillusionment. He wants to shatter the illusion of the false God that a lot of us think we worship. He wants us to shatter this idea that God is small, that God can be controlled, that God can be manipulated, that God can be fully understood by our mind. He wants to shatter the idea that, we, that, that God looks just like us. Because we often get disappointed when God doesn't act like us. But the problem is, thank God that God isn't just like us. And God wants to change the illusion that we have as to who he is and to change it into a true picture of who he is. And do you know what God looks like? He looks like a God that would hang on a cross for us. He looks like a God that would forgive us while we were crucifying him. He looks like a God that loved us before we loved him. So there's so much that we can't understand about God, but you know what God looks like. And God at Easter reminds us that we need to shatter the illusion of all our false expectations and center our vision of God on the cross. The other thing that keeps us from God is doubt. You see, if we pick up the story in verse 14, we'll read there. At this, Mary turned around and saw Jesus standing there in the tomb, but she did not realize it was Jesus. He asked her, woman, why are you crying? Who is it that you're looking for? Thinking he was the gardener, has anyone ever here ever been mistaken for someone that you're not? It's okay. The Son of God was mistaken for being a gardener. Sir, if you carried him away, tell me where you've put him and I'll get him. And Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned towards him and cried in Aramaic, Rabboni, which means teacher. You see, the first area of doubt that so many of us struggle with is what I would call emotional doubt. It's a doubt that we can't believe in the goodness of God because of the pains in our own life. And sometimes you can have pain in your life and it blinds you to the reality of God who's right next to you. Do you know, they've done surveys of uh, a lot of the new atheists um, in America and particularly younger atheists, the people that identify as being atheists. The primary reason why people are atheists are not for intellectual reasons, but for existential reasons to do with people's personal life, people's pain, people's suffering, people's fears people's sense of injustice. You see, the main reason why people don't um, believe in God is not because of the intellect, it's because of pain and because of just this sense of hurt and there's a blockage in our life. Have you ever had a blockage in your life that kept you from loving someone? I believe Mary, as she was standing right next to Jesus, she was so torn up in grief. She was so reminded by the pains of her past. She was so reminded by how unfair it was that Jesus had died, even though she placed all her trust in him that he was right next to her and she couldn't even see him. I want to tell everyone here that Jesus is right beside you today. That Jesus is right beside you today. And don't let the one that can actually heal your past be shielded from you because of your past. Don't let the one that wants to come and minister to you and guide you and reshape your past into a beautiful future be blocked because of some of those things that are very real. Those, those emotional doubts in your heart, the things where you say, I just don't know if I can trust anyone 
and Jesus is right next to you, the only one you can trust. It's actually right for some of us not to trust certain people, but we can trust Jesus, the one who loved us and the one who gave himself for us. And it's when, how do we trust again when we've had these doubts? It's when we recognize that God knows our name, that God knows every hair on our head, that God knows every thought we, and, and he, he knows our past and he's going to use us from where we are today into a glorious future, that he has a wonderful future for us. There's another doubt. It is intellectual doubt. We pick that story up in 24, and his name's Thomas. Now, Thomas, one of the 12, was not with the disciples when Jesus came. So the other disciples told him, we've seen the Lord. But he said to them, unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my finger where the nails were and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. A week later, his disciples were in the house again, and Thomas was with them. Though the doors were locked, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Then he said to Thomas, put your finger here, see my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. Stop doubting and believe. And Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. You see, Thomas didn't have that, those kind of emotional, painful grief blockages. He just had an intellectual blockage, which I think is fair enough. Unless I see Jesus risen from the dead, I'm not going to believe it. Unless I see his pierced hands and his pierced side, and unless I see him living and walking and breathing in the flesh, not as an angel, but in the flesh, I'm not going to believe. You see, one of the things that um, amazes me is I know people, and even people in the early church, there were people that actually touched and experienced the living Jesus that turned away from him. For some of us, we will never have enough facts. We will never have enough evidence that Jesus really is who he said he is. There's a few indisputable facts of the Easter story. The first fact is this, that Jesus really did die on a cross. Atheists, Jewish historians, early Christian scholars, they all agree he died on a cross. They all agree that his tomb was empty. And his body has never been found, even though there was every reason for people, for the Jews and for the Romans to try to find his body and expose it as a fraud. But his body has never been found. And there's also evidence, the scriptures in 1 Corinthians say that there were many hundreds of men and women that experienced Jesus as risen from the dead. And the early Christian authors said, hey, why don't you talk to some of these people and chat to them because they experienced the risen Jesus. This is not just made up. This is, this is history, that people believed that they had seen Jesus risen from the dead. I'll tell you what else is history. That a small group of Christians that were hiding, fearful, scared for their lives, had such an encounter with the God that died and rose again, Jesus Christ, that they were willing to give their lives for the truth that he was risen. These people that were fearful, these people that were running in the opposite direction from, um, from authorities, they became courageous warriors in saying, we will give our lives for the truth that Jesus rose from the dead and therefore God is true. Jesus is God in the flesh. He really did love us. He really did come to save us. He really did overcome sin and death and the grave. And we can give our lives for him because we know that death is not the end. I'm going to um, throw to the screens and we're going to have a look at a couple of testimonies from some young men in this church community that have experienced the love of God, that have experienced the Easter story and God has turned their life around. I want to ask you as you watch these to think about your life, to think about things that you're going through and just open up to God's spirit as he might be speaking to you about some doubts, as he might be speaking to you about some emotional pains from your past as he might be speaking to you about some disappointments that might keep you from Jesus. Let's look to the screens as we watch together. I wonder what would keep you from Jesus this Easter. I wonder for some of us if we do have disappointments that are keeping us from Jesus. I wonder if some of us have doubts that are keeping us from him. I wonder if for some of us it's actually... There's, a, there's another D, there's disappointments, there's doubt, and there's just this idea of death. 
In the Bible, in 2 Timothy 1, verses 9 to 10, it says, But it has been revealed through the appearance of our Saviour Jesus, who has destroyed death and has brought life and immortality to light through the gospel. He has destroyed death. I want to tell you this, that the Easter story is a story of disappointment being put to death, of doubt being put to death, and death being put to death. And I don't just mean about passing away, which we will pass away. But it's this culture of death where we feel hopeless. Even though we're alive, we're spiritually dead. Even though we do life, we're not really living, we're just existing. And I think Easter is the time from the cross when Jesus cried out, It is finished! It was like the most passionate symbol of God saying, Enough is enough! This culture of death and decay and disappointment and the overwhelming appearing victory of evil will not proceed any longer because I am in control. I am the King. And with Jesus dying and rising again, He is the first fruits for all of us, which means that we too can pass through death into life, that we can follow in His footsteps, that we don't have to fear death that we don't have to be defined by our sin and our brokenness and our struggles and our self-centeredness. Easter isn't just the end, a reminder that death has lost its power over us as human beings. It's a reminder that we are set free from dead religion. This idea that we have to strive and we have to climb this ladder to win God's approval. Easter says, stop climbing. I have come to earth. I have died on a cross. And all you need to do is humbly come to the foot of the cross and say, Jesus, thank you. You have done it all. You have done it all for me. And I think there's so many people in this room. Some of you have been Christians for 10 years, but you've been trying, trying, trying to be a good Christian or trying to win God's favour. But when you realise that Jesus has done it all and you come to the foot of the cross, you can leave the cross and you can actually be different because of the love of God and the power of the Spirit in your life. Like we heard from Sid, like we heard from Elvis, there is new life that flows from the cross and the resurrection. As we heard from the people that were baptised, there's new life that flows. And I would ask you today, is God offering you new life for some of you in this room?